here we go. Here we Corona are. Porch Edition Week 3. We are continuing this series uh, on Esther, God Save the Queen. How you doing, man? I'm doing pretty good. Yeah? I'm, uh, I'm excited just decided to be here. Come on, bro. I yeah, love it, man. It's just nice to get out of the house. It is so nice to get out of the house. Good grief, man. Everyone's but obviously got- stay away from me. Cabin fever. Hey, um, so we're going to wrap up the book of Esther tonight. If you're just joining us, we'll give you a recap on everything that's been going on. But let me ask a question. Um, what is your favorite board game? Ooh. Recently, it's been, have you ever heard of Secret Hitler? Oh, I totally have heard of Secret Hitler. Yeah, that's, that's, it's, if y'all have not seen Secret Hitler, I would highly recommend it. Which sounds like it's, a much worse game than it actually yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it actually does. That's yeah, totally. really weird. But such a fun game. Watermark favorite too. It's a total that. watermark favorite, which is going to confuse people. But uh, this is another. It is a great game. Um, <laughs> Risk would be up there. There's several games in my house right now. Though with little kids, we are reintroducing all types of games that are like from my childhood in order to stop all the Disney watching that's taking place. So we're playing Guess Who. Do you remember Guess Who? Oh yeah. Where you flip it open, you have to yeah it, it, flip them down if they're not the mm-hmm. person. We're playing uh, Hungry Hungry Hippos. Oh, wild son. game. Oh. Totally yeah. loud game. He's all about it. And I played a new game for the first time this week called Scategories. You heard of Scategories? I don't think so. Scategories is like, if you're a millennial or younger, you probably have no idea what that game is. But my wife loves that game. She was like, we're playing this and um, was trying to be, you know, a supportive husband. And so kids went down. We played Scategories. Never played the game before. And I'm like, how do you play? And she was like, oh, you'll figure it out. And her mind is like really self-explanatory, which works at some level, but then there's different rules that are a part of it. So we started playing and because I didn't know the rules, it was like every time I would try to do something. So the way it kind of high level works is, and I'm gonna get blown up in the comments, I bet on this, (laughs) by people being like, you don't know how to place categories, is you'll roll the dice and it'll have letters on the dice. So it's like a 26 uh, edge die or some level of edge. You roll it and it's like a G and then you pick a card and on that card, it'll have 12 different categories of things where you have to write a uh, favorite boy name that starts with a G, favorite music band, type of food, uh-huh. continent or country or just these different things. And so we're playing the game and there'd be different things where she'd be like, no, you can't write the same name twice. So if you wrote down, you know, uh, Garth Brooks for favorite music musician, and then you wrote Garth for favorite boy's name that mm-hmm. starts with a G, doesn't count. Or if you had two letters Two words that started with the same letter and you're on S and you have SpongeBob Square SpongeBob SquarePants. That'd be two S. So you get double points on that. So it'd be like, what? You're cheating. And it was because she didn't ever explain the rules. I didn't know exactly how to win the game, all that was involved, mm-hmm. what would count against you. Because if you don't know the game to abort it or how to play the rules, excuse me, if you don't know the rules to a game, you can't win the game. Right. What does it have to do with what we're talking about tonight? Well, as it relates to the game of life, What we talk about all the time with young adults is there are a lot of people, everyone is playing the game of life, but a lot of people don't know the rules. They don't know what it means to actually have a success or to win, what failure looks like. And so just like in any board game, if you don't know the rules, you can't win the game. If you don't know the way life works or really the rules, the objective of the game of life, if you will, you will not be able to win. Hmm. And you may be thinking to yourself, no, I wanna know what success looks like or thinks like. And so wherever you are listening right now, I just want you to think about like, what is a successful life to you look like? What are the objectives really of life? What would a failed life look like? Mm -hmm. And what would it look like to at the end of your days? I mean, because there's nothing, there are at least few things more tragic, maybe nothing more tragic than to get to the end of your life or to the end of your 20s or to the end of your 30s or 40s or 50s and waste your life. Or waste a decade and not have played according to it. So God, all throughout the scriptures, gives us principles and truths that are a part of the rules of the game of life, if you will. Because he, as much as we ever will want to, wants us to experience success. He wants us to live a life of purpose and a life that is, at the end of our days, we look back and say, man, it wasn't a waste and it wasn't a fail. So tonight, we're going to continue the book of Esther. We're going to look at three principles from the final four chapters. So we're about to go through some Bible tonight. Wow. That will relate to uh, what it looks like, some key things that are involved anytime you're going to succeed at the game of life. So the book of Esther, for a recap, uh, is a uh, book that is about, it's named after Queen Esther. It takes place 500 years before Jesus was around. You, you know what country it's in, modern day country? I don't want to get it wrong. Yeah, we go. Uh, it's in <laughs> Iran, modern day Iran. It was the Persian Empire at that time. Basically, what had happened 500 years before Jesus was around, so 500 BC, Persia, which is a, an empire of 
ancient times, shows up, conquer the known world. They took over everything. They're led by a king named Xerxes. He's one of the main characters in the story. I said, when I think about Xerxes, I think of Jake Gyllenhaal from the one movie that probably no one has ever seen. There he is, just looking fly. Uh, or he's King Xerxes. He rules over the land. Right. He's powerful. He's wealthy. He's got the palace. He's got the kingdom. He's got everything. And he's not a believer in God, but he ends up uh, week one, we covered holding a bachelor Persia or a mixture between a, a bachelor and beauty competition and like sex competition to find who will be the next queen of Persia. And Esther was ripped out of her house and she was declared, she won the competition. So Esther, when I think of Esther, I think of uh, Wonder Woman right here because she's kind of the Wonder Woman in our story. Gal Gadot. Wow. Fierce, man. So fierce. So that's character number two. So you got King Xerxes, you got Esther, then you have Uncle Jesse Mordecai, who I think of Uncle Jesse, of course, the most Uh, famous. And then our villain, Haman, which is Jafar, whether you like the cartoon version of, uh, you know, Jafar, which I think they'll pop up there, or the real version of Jafar. There he is uh, with Iago, man. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, straight up Iago. <laughs> uh, and uh, those are the main characters. And so week one, we were introduced from this, this peasant girl, Esther, who all of a sudden goes from po- poverty to the palace. Then week two, we're introduced to the villain where Haman set out a plot to kill all of the Jewish people, all the people of God. He basically, because Mordecai wouldn't bow and worship him, he was like, I'm not just gonna kill you. I wanna kill all the Jewish people. And because Haman was number two in charge, he was the prime minister, He had the ability to put in a decree that allowed that to happen. So Hmm. we're told that all the Jewish people knew there was going to come a day, March 7th, where they were going to all be killed. It was months ahead and that they were going to lose their lives. And then last week, uh, we dove in and just kind of looked at three more truths as it relates to fairy tale faith and talked about Disney. So if week one was Bachelor Persia, and if week two was Making a Murderer, and if week three was Disney Plus, if you will, and what's involved in true faith, This week will be Silver Linings Playbook, that even when you can't see it, God is at work, and even in the midst of all the craziness that has happened so far in this story that looked chaotic, that at times uh, was so painful, that at times clearly was, it just seemed like God was absent. What did he say? Even when you don't see See it, you're working. working. (laughs) That's right. I absolutely would. Had to. You know, they're all thinking it. Oh, 100%. (laughs) And uh, and even when all that's going on, that God is clearly at work. Esther is one of the few, the two books in the Bible that does not mention the word of God, or I mean the name of God. Mm. But even though he's absent, the whole purpose of the book is that God is at work throughout the story and he's moving the pieces. Even when you can't see it, He's working. That's right. That's right. All right. Hey, we're going to be Esther chapter seven. If you have a Bible, flip it open there. If not, it'll be up on the screen and we're going to fly through this story. We're going to go through like four chapters uh, and I'll summarize every now and then to, to keep it going. So here we go. Wait, what chapter? Uh, chapter seven. Last week ended with the king and the queen and Haman all in having dinner. Mm-hmm. And the queen was like, hey, king, here's my one request. I want to have dinner again with you tomorrow. Because the king uh, and Esther had not come to the king yet and said, hey, there's a plan to kill all my people. And by the way, I'm Jewish. Because remember, she hid that. Mm -hmm. So that's where we're going to pick it up. Dinner number two. We're sitting there with Esther and the king and Haman. What a bomb for sure. All right, verse one. So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet. So they're at the dinner table. Mm -hmm. On the second occasion, while they were drinking wine, and king... And the king again said to Esther, hey, tell me what you want, Queen Esther. What is your request? I will give it to you, even if it is up to half of my kingdom. Queen Esther replied, if I've found favor with the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my request, I ask, here's my request, that the life, my life and the lives of my people be spared. For my people and I have been sold to those who would kill, slaughter, and annihilate us. I love this next sentence. If we had merely been sold as slaves, I could remain quiet. For that would have been too trivial a matter to warrant disturbing the king. As in like, hey, they're planning to kill us. Had we just been sold as slaves, I wouldn't even even bothered you. I know you're a really busy guy, but I figured if they (laughs) kill the queen, somebody is going to lose their job because you're going to be like, hey, where's the queen? And they're going to be like, oh, we killed her. And that's not going to be a good day for anybody. So I figured it was probably worth bringing up to you. (laughs) It's like such funny wording. Uh, who would do such a thing? King Xerxes, Jake Gyllenhaal demands. Who would be so presumptuous as to touch you, the queen? Esther replied. And remember, it's Esther, Xerxes, and Haman sitting at the dinner table. Mm-hmm. Jafar. Jafar. About to get exposed. This wicked Haman, mm. who is our adversary and our enemy, 
Haman grew pale with fright before the king and the queen. I don't think Haman knew that Esther was Jewish. So he's probably sitting in there at the dinner table with the king and the queen. And the queen's like, hey, king, here's my one request. They're planning to kill me and all my people and all my family. And Haman's going, wow, that is crazy. I didn't know there was other like crazy murderers out there planning to <laughs> genocide an entire people. But who would do that against the queen? That's nuts. Who would ever do that? And then she says, by the way, it's Haman. And he's got to be going, I had no idea she was the queen, the king. Gulp. Yeah, it's a huge <laughs> gulp moment. The king steps outside and he's in a rage, jumped to his feet. He went out in the palace garden. Haman, however, stayed behind, verse seven, to plead for his life with Queen Esther. For he knew that the king intended to kill him. In his despair, he fell on the couch where Queen Esther was reclining. Just as the king was returning from the palace garden, the king exclaimed, Will he even assault the queen right here in the palace before my very eyes? Mm. So he's, he's like just groveling for his life and he falls on the couch that she's sitting on and the king comes back in and he doesn't think he's groveling. He thinks yeah. he's assaulting my wife. And he's like, dude, this is game over. As soon as the king spoke, his attendants covered Haman's face, signaling his doom. They put a bag over his head. He'd never see light of day again. Then Harbona, one of the king's eunuchs, said, Haman has set up a sharpened pole that stands 75 feet tall in his own courtyard. He intended to use it to impale Mordecai, the man who saved the king from assassination. So Harbona's sitting there and, and we don't know what his feeling of Haman, but he at least is like, hey, I got an idea. There's a big pole in Haman's yard. He was planning to kill Mordecai. You remember Mordecai, the guy who saved your life. I mean, as great as that guy was, can't believe Haman would want to do that. But why don't we throw him on the pole? He was trying to get a job. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> he was trying to get a promo. Uh, then impale Haman on it, the king offered or ordered. So they impaled Haman on the pole he had set up for Mordecai. And the king's anger subsided. None of this is what the Bible is saying is good or right or ideal. Mm -hmm. It just is describing what happened. It's interesting, and, and we may come back to this, is that the enemy of God's people and his plot was ended by the death of someone on a wooden pole or on a tree. The same word is used for crucifixion. So it's just interesting parallel to what happened with Jesus years and years and years later, that Jesus would end the enemy's plot not by the enemy dying on a pole, but by Jesus dying on a cross for mm -hmm. you and for me. Uh, Esther chapter eight, verse one. On the same day, King Xerxes gave the property of Haman, who is number two in the land, the guy's got a big estate, the enemy of the Jews to Queen Esther. Then Mordecai was brought before the king, for Esther had told the king how they were related. It was her uncle. And the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken back from Haman, and he gave it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed Mordecai to be in charge of Haman's property. So Mordecai all of a sudden is now elevated essentially to Haman's position, number two in the land. And, uh, and Esther is given Haman's property. Esther went again before the king, falling down on his face at his feet and begging him with tears to stop the evil plot devised by Haman against the Jews. She goes down and she's like, please stop. They're gonna kill my people. He's fixed today. Remember that decree had gone out mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago that uh, just horrifically, all the Jewish people were told on that fixed day, they were uh, liable to be killed or anybody could kill them and take their stuff. And she's begging, please reverse that decree. Esther said, if it pleases the king, if I found favor with him, and if he thinks it is right and I'm pleasing him, let there be a decree that reverses the order of Haman, who ordered that the Jews throughout the king's provinces should be destroyed. For how can I, verse six, endure to see my people and my family slaughtered and destroyed? Verse eight, now go ahead, and send, King Xerxes replies, send a message to the Jews in the king's name, telling them whatever you want and seal it with the king's ring. But remember, whatever has already been written in the king's name and sealed with his signet ring can never be revoked. So this is interesting. And that time, anytime a king or anytime the, the uh, leader of the country made a law, it was impossible to reverse that law. You could make other law laws, but unlike today where, you know, you can repeal something mm -hmm. and that time with the Persian empire, anytime a king made something, um, some uh, people think it may have been because they thought of him as like deity or um, different reasons behind that, but they couldn't reverse it. They could just add other laws to it. So he's going, I can't reverse the fact that we already said the Jewish people will be killed on this day, but we can add additional laws. And he says, write whatever you want, put it in there. So on June 25th, I love the detail, man of the Bible. Yeah. 
King's secretaries were summoned and a decree was written exactly as Mordecai dictated it. The decree, verse 10, was written in the name of King Xerxes, sealed with his signet ring, and Mordecai sent the dispatches by swift messengers who rode fast horses, bred for the king's service all throughout the empire. Here's what the king's decree said. So Mordecai writes something down, they send it out, it's a new decree. It gave the Jews in every city authority to unite and defend themselves. They were allowed to kill, slaughter, and annihilate anyone of any nationality or province who might attack them or their children or their wives and to take the property of their enemies. The chosen day for this event throughout the provinces of King Xerxes was March 7th of next year. So they had a decree that they were to be killed. And basically this new decree was like, hey, you guys can unite, prepare, be ready for war. It's pretty crazy. It's like the Hunger Games and Game of Thrones and just nut stuff going on. And as we're going to see, though, God was clearly at work in the midst of all of it. But that's the second decree that's been put out there. Uh, the king's, oh, sorry, verse 15. Then Mordecai left the king's presence wearing the royal robe of blue and white, the great crown of gold, and an outer cloak of fine linen and purple. So he's, he's looking good. Uh, <laughs> and the people of Susa celebrated the new decree. The Jews were filled with joy and gladness were honored everywhere. In every province and city, wherever the king's decree arrived, the Jews rejoiced and a great celebration took place and declared a public festival and holiday. And many of the people of the land became Jews themselves. We're gonna come back to that. Uh, verse, uh, for they fear what the Jews might do to them. Chapter nine, verse one. So on March 7th, the two decrees of the king. So fast forward, because remember it was in June 25th. Mm-hmm. Now we're all the way into March The day comes, the two decrees of the king are put into effect. On that day, the enemy of the Jews who had hoped to overpower them, but quite the opposite happened. It was the Jews who overpowered their enemies. So anybody who came and attacked them, the Jewish people were victorious. The Jews gathered together in cities all throughout the king's provinces to attack anyone who tried to harm them, but no one could take a stand against them for everyone was afraid of them. And here's one of the reasons why, verse three, for all the nobles, that's the royalty, of the provinces, that's like the governors of all the states, if you will, because they have 127 states, be like in America, all the people in authority in every state, the highest officers, governors, royal officials, they all help the Jews for fear of Mordecai. For Mordecai had been promoted in the king's palace and his fame had spread all throughout the provinces and the empire. So they go out, they successfully defend themselves. The rest of like the armies in these provinces help them and protect them. And so that's likely one of the reasons why, in addition to God just giving them favor and protection, that they are successful, they don't lose their lives, and they're victorious on that day. Um, But the victory still involved them going to fight and then protecting themselves. It still involved a battle with Mm -hmm. them. Verse 20, at the end, to celebrate the victory that God had given them, Mordecai recorded these events and he sent letters to the Jewish people in the kingdom. So the battle's over. Jewish people won and saved their lives. Yep. And Mordecai sends out letters to everybody in the, the, every Jewish person throughout the provinces, calling them to celebrate an annual festival on these two days. He told them to celebrate them with feasting and gladness by giving gifts of food to each other, presents to the poor. This would commemorate a time when Jews gained relief from their enemies, when their sorrow was turned into gladness and their mourning was turned into joy. So you following it? So yep. basically... They're victorious, and he's like, we're for now on going forward, going to celebrate this day every single year. So Jewish people everywhere celebrate God's deliverance of his people. The day that they were supposed to be wiped out. Yes. Yep. The day they were supposed to die was the day that they are now celebrating. Celebrate are victorious. Um, skip down to verse 29 of chapter 9. Queen Esther, uh, daughter of Abigail, uh, Abihail, how do you yeah. say that? <clears throat> uh, along with Mordecai the Jew wrote another letter putting the queen's full authority behind Mordecai's letter to establish the festival of Purim, uh, which is a festival that even today Jewish people still celebrate. But really the entire book ends and, and we're told that God, in the midst of all the brokenness and chaos, he preserves, he protects his people. He puts Esther in a position of authority and, uh, and he reverses Haman's all the wicked plan And the day that they were to die became a day of celebration. And the clear message of the entire book is that even when you can't see God's face, that he's not at the forefront, he is very clearly at work. Even when it looks like he's not working, 
He is using everything chaotic and broken. He's, a, he's using corona right now and he's still at work all around us. And that's really been the message. And one of the reasons that today, again, as we said, um, Purim was celebrated a couple weeks ago by those who are Jewish, if you have Jewish friends, that that took place this year on, on March 9th. But here's what I wanna focus on for a few minutes. I wanna pull out three principles that are just parallels to, I think, our experience as it relates to um, living a successful life. Three yeah. things that, that parallel. Anything you, you want to add or clarify or yeah, that was confusing? Yeah, I think the one thing, it's a lot of text. So it's a lot of text. I think the one thing, can you just paraphrase for me? Uh, so they couldn't get rid of a decree yep. that the king had made, but they could write, she could write another one. He gave yep. her the pen and paper and said, you get to write it. Mordecai, but yep. Oh, okay. Mordecai got to write it. Yep. Good to know. And uh, what exactly did he, can you just paraphrase one more time what he wrote? He basically wrote out that, hey, all the Jewish people out there can band together. And uh, it's kind of a funny thing because you'd be like, what else were you going to do? But they may have had access to like the king's military or military around there. They certainly, by Mordecai writing that, were given encouragement from the local state governments that they were a part of to support the Jewish people. And basically he wrote out that Jewish people can proactively attack anybody that they think may be attacking them. Gotcha. So he gave the right and permission to do that legally. So it made them seem more powerful. Exactly. That way everyone is like, I'm with the Jews because the king's with the Jews. Exactly. Gotcha. Hey, you okay. mess with them, it's not going to go well. And even okay. the you know, local governors and governments were all supporting the Jewish people. So. That's interesting. Because I, I, I think I naturally would have suspected some way for like war not to even happen at all. Yep. I don't know. Like something creative. Yep. But it's interesting to... Okay, it makes a lot more sense. Yeah, it is. Yeah. That there was a victory, but it still involved fighting. Yeah. So um, really, let me camp on three things that I think as we wrap up the book, I just want to highlight yeah. that I, I see in the story. That's such a parallel to our lives. The first one is this. You and I can't change the past, but you can alter the future. Just like the king, he couldn't change what had been written, mm. but he could write a new law. Hey, I can't change what's in the past. That's already there, but I can change what will happen in the future. That's such a parallel, I think, for our experiences as humans, because you and I, at some point in realizing in life, if you're gonna have a successful life, you gotta realize, hey, I can't go back and relive the past. There's gonna be things in my rear view mirror from high school, college, whatever stage of life you're in that you wish you had a do-over on. And all you can't, and although you cannot go back and rewrite the past, you can rewrite the future that you're in. And this is so huge because people, they walk around today and the shame and guilt from their past. I mean, Christians will walk around today and they have shame and guilt from past decisions, past broken relationships, abortion, uh, you know, sexual abuse, things that were done to them. And there's this sense of like, man, I just carry a guilt that I wish I could do away with or get rid of, mm. or I wish that I hadn't blown it mm. um, on my first job with that employer, or with parents. You cannot go back and undo the past. Jesus can forgive, and it has been forgiven if you are in Christ. And although you cannot go and do that, you can rewrite the future you're headed to. Paul, the apostle, would say that um, you, if you're in Jesus, you're no longer marked by the things that you've done before. You're no longer marked by your past. That if anyone is in Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17, mm -hmm. they're a new creation. The old is gone and the new is here. Paul, who was a murderer, who could have been easily tempted to go like, man, I cannot believe. He was a murderer before he became a Christian. Like he had done things that most people listening will never compare to the level. Paul said he was the chief of sinners. And we at least know he was responsible for the death of Christians. And he says, one thing, I do not consider myself as having taken hold of everything in Christ. But one thing I do, I forget what is behind me mm -hmm. and I strain towards what is ahead. Not that there's not consequences for decisions in our past and not that there's not um, things that we can go back and own and ask forgiveness for. But you cannot rewrite the past, but you can rewrite the future. And that's important because unproductive is me sitting around being like, man, I just, I'm covered in shame and guilt. I'm damaged goods. This is how I see it on a lot of times play out with young adults is they think like, dude, I'm just, I'm damaged goods because of, my dating history and what I've done with guys, my sexual past, like a godly girl or godly guy will never like me. Yeah, being abused. I've been abused. Abortion. It's just, gonna, uh, I had an abortion. Yeah. Like I just, I'm unworthy. And the message of the gospel is that you have been totally forgiven. And Jesus doesn't look at you and define you by your past. And he wants you 
to begin to realign and redefine your future according to his word. And that is a place where you are in the driver's seat. While you can't go back and rewrite just like the king, I can't re-undo what has already taken place and been written, but I can write something new. And so for us, I think it looks like us going, man, I am in the driver's seat of writing the future that God is, the future story I'm gonna have and the future that is in front of me. How am I doing at really taking advantage of that? Yeah, I, another one I, person I wanna speak to I just thought of was like, I think someone who's been caught. Yeah. Like if you've been caught in a, in, a, in a really wrong action, a sinful action, whatever it may be, I think a lot of times the enemy really keeps you stuck. Like yeah. he, it almost like the shame that comes with being caught can almost make you feel like you're never worthy again to do something, especially something, uh, kingdom minded, yeah. something, uh, with, with, like, with the Lord on your side, it, it can just forever feel like that's kind of your reputation now. And so just even this applies to the person that has been caught in, in an action totally. they're ashamed of. And for me, David, like what, something you're making me think of is, um, in this story, when the King is giving Mordecai the ability to rewrite. He says, um, but you may write in verse eight of chapter eight, but you may write as you please with regard to the Jews in the name of the king and seal it with the king's ring. For an, an edict written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's ring cannot be revoked. Yep. And I'm so sorry if you were going here. I don't, uh, but no, Ephesians, on. On. <clears throat> Ephesians one just says in him. So in the, in the, in the death of Christ and his death, burial and resurrection, in him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Yep. And Titus 3, 5, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and yep. the renewal of the Holy Spirit, yep. that Holy Spirit that seals us. And I think a lot of people, they think like you're saying something of their past that that ceiling doesn't exist for them. It's like, well, I broke it and now it's, I'm over, I'm doomed. But this tells us that the Holy Spirit is what secures our identity in Christ. Totally. It's not dependent on our own actions. Yeah. It's really encouraging. So really wallowing in the past is, is just not a, for a follower of Jesus, the best thing you can do is say, hey, the past doesn't define me, Jesus does. And now I get to be a part of helping define the future in front of me. So wherever you're at today, the best opportunity in front of you is going, man, I want to meet and be on purpose and intentional as I write the person, as I write the chapter that I'm going to live out as the future in front of me comes. I'm going to surrender every day to Jesus and try to live according to his word. I'm going to, uh, some of you that maybe I need to confess hidden sin mm -hmm. that I've never opened up to anybody about. Others, you being intentional to uh, rewrite or write the future that, that, uh, future story you're going to tell will involve you breaking up with a relationship right now that you just know is toxic or you're not in a place to date. Like, let's just be honest. You're not in a place where you're healthy enough. Others of you, it may involve forgiving a family member mm. who really hurt you or asking for forgiveness from a family member that you really hurt, even if they haven't asked you uh, yeah. for that forgiveness. Like, hey, I'm just going to extend it. But we are all uh, in the driver's seat largely as it relates to writing this story in front of us. So you can't undo the past, but you can rewrite or alter the future that you're gonna head. And you were headed towards, and, and I think one thing that ministered to me that I've been, I heard recently from a friend that um, is like, at some point, this season of Corona, we talked about it on Views from the Porch, is gonna be a story that we look back on and it was a season of our life and we tell about that season. Like it's a story, it'll be a part yeah. of all of our story, it'll be in the past and uh, it'll be a part of the story that we tell. And that's really true for all of us in life right now. At some point this season today, what you're doing with your 20s, the type of dating relationships and how you date, the way you use your time, how you work at the office, that's all gonna be a part of the story that when you're 40 or 50 or 60, you're gonna look back and be, this is the story of how I met your mom, how we pursued purity, how we dated together, or hey, how we kind of slept together. We met at that bar, we met on Tinder, and we ended up just getting married after we lived together for three years. Both of those are two versions of stories. And you get to today decide which type of story do you wanna tell and which story are you writing? Because the decisions you're making today are shaping the future you're headed to. That's so good. So here, really quickly, the next one, and uh, I don't know how much time we have here, but next one on... Uh, You're doing great. Yeah. Where are you going to go, man? You can't go anywhere. <laughs> what you Corona, you have to for do? real. Uh, the next thing from this story that just jumps out to me that we talked a little bit about already was 
you can't win the battle if you aren't willing to fight. Mm. You can't win any victory. You won't have victory over a battle. Like you won't win the battle if you're not willing to fight. What does that have to do with us? And none of us are, most of us are not, you know, in the army or in the military. Um, Here's where I see it in their story. God said, God provided a way and a path towards victory, but it involved them still fighting. Like you observe that. Yeah. Which is really interesting. You could, would have thought like, oh, he just stopped everything from happening. And he didn't. He involved a victory that also involved them fighting. And I think for most of us, uh, no, not even for most of us, for all of us, yeah. any great victory over the spiritual battles and temptations and sins that you have to wage war against and I have to wage war against involves us both all having to fight. There's this idea in Christianity that, hey, once you become a Christian, the temptations I have to lust after people who are not my wife or to get angry at people um, who, you know, frustrate me or to be selfish, all those kind of just went away because the Holy Spirit now takes over. And that for most, not even for most of us, for everyone is not the case. That when you follow Jesus, it involves daily picking up your cross, Jesus would say, Mark chapter nine, and following him, which is daily dying to yourself and dying to your sin nature. You know, how would you describe a sin nature? A sin nature is that thing in me that has always just been there and a really practical example, if I were to go home right now and my roommates who have been at home all day, there's dishes in the sink, I could walk in and just naturally, I, I could just naturally assume the worst and be like, man, they're so lazy. They've just been sitting around here watching Netflix all day and no one's doing the dishes and just find myself frustrated at my roommates. And for all I know, they've had a really difficult day. And instead of just doing the dishes, like that's totally. just like something in me that just, is just naturally there and it's always been there. Yeah, it's a thing in all of us that allows sin to come naturally. Yeah. It's like why I never have to work at being angry. Mm-hmm. Like you've never had to work at being selfish. <laughs> Nobody has to work at being like, you know what's really hard for me? Well, I don't know if this is true. For most of us, lusting or um, being entitled. That just, it doesn't come yeah. easy for me. I Comfort. feel like I'm just so gracious and <laughs> good. That person listening it's clearly clouded by pride that comes naturally and yep. easy to that person. But it's that thing inside of all of us where sin just comes naturally. It's a part of our nature. The Bible says that is your sin nature. And as long as you are, you and I are in this life, that's going to be a part of us, mm-hmm. um, a part of our life. And so daily, I have to not listen to that and put that to death and try to walk in dependence on the spirit of God. In uh, Romans chapter eight, verse 13 along this idea of, hey, you can't win the battle. If your battle's anxiety, maybe it's an eating disorder, a pornography, a body image in general, maybe it's an anger problem, um, whatever, fill in the blank. You won't win that battle without you fighting against that, making the decision when I don't want to, when it's not easy, when it doesn't feel like the right thing to do, I'm gonna choose to put that to death Mm -hmm. and choose not to follow that and try to follow God's word. In Romans 8, I said that, Uh, Verse 13, it says, if you live according to your sinful nature, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Colossians chapter three says, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual morality, and he just gives some examples. Impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Uh, In 1 Peter chapter two, verse 11, it says, uh, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, Abstain from your sinful desires, which wage war against your soul. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Bible says you and I have to declare war on our sin nature, on all the different ways that sin manifests itself or sin pops up in my life. Anytime that happens, I got to go to war against it. And I love Peter's language because he says, your sin nature has already declared war on you. You should declare war on it. Yeah. That uh, John Owen, this old pastor made a line that like, hey, if you are either, all of us in life are either killing sin or it is killing us. It's killing relationships. It's killing our relationship with God, our love for people, killing like, it ends people's actual lives all the time. Yeah. And the Bible says that you and I can experience victory, but it involves a fight, a battle. So if your struggle is same-sex attraction, if it, if it is an eating disorder, if it's lust or anger, like are my problems, it involves me daily. Here's what I said the battle looks like. Here's how I define it and and scripturally, at least, he calls us to all this. I'd love to hear what, what you'd add or if you, uh, if you agree. Biblically, we battle by living authentically, 
with the people of God, according to the word of God, and depending on the spirit of God. Biblically, here's how you battle. Every single day, this is a day by day. It's not fixed. It's not a one time. Every day I have to battle by living authentically. That's confessing sin to other people who are followers of Jesus at like a heart level. Like I was tempted. Um, I'm tempted to believe that my worth comes from my paycheck. I'm tempted to believe that uh, it's tempted to just lust. I'm having lustful thoughts about a coworker that I work with or about past relationships, or I clicked on something on the internet, on social media that I just like spent too much time on that girl's page. I got to confess all those things and do confess all those things to my small group of guys. As I wage war and battle, I'm living authentically with the people of God, according to the word of God that I want to align. And this is tricky in this culture, man, because the Bible says align your life with the word of God. And everybody wants to align the word of God with their wants. Mm -hmm. Like this is kind of, this is what I think he really means. And that's not relevant. It's kind of outdated. And you can't trust everything that's in there. I mean, we don't eat shellfish. We do eat shellfish. Come on, good grief. Leviticus. And Leviticus. <laughs> it's like the go-to everyone has. It's like Leviticus. Don't have tattoos. I, you still eat bacon, right? Uh -huh. You say no bacon? No. With so many podcasts we have out on there. That is a dumb question. But if that is something you fall into, uh, go check us out on Views from the Porch as it relates to why the Bible's appropriate or relevant. Yeah. Uh, but point being, I live authentically with the word of God. I try to align my life and have others align my life with, uh, sorry, with the people of God, align my life with the word of God and walk in dependence on the spirit of God. That day by day, God, I can't defeat anger. I can't defeat lust. I can't defeat anxiety. I need your help. And that just involves a moment by moment prayerfulness and trying to walk in the spirit. And uh, anytime that I don't walk in line with, I don't battle, I do the first thing. I live authentically with the people of God and I bring it into the light and, uh, and I have others encourage me on that journey. But that's a day by day, every single, I think the thing that's hardest for me, the thing that I hate about it is I wish it was gone. I wish it was over. You didn't have to battle. And every day I have to get up and still battle that. Yeah. I, uh, last year, I think I've shared on here before, went through regeneration, which is our 12 step recovery. And um, it's like celebrate recovery. It's, um, it's an amazing ministry if you're in Dallas or if you have regeneration at your church. But just because I saw like there was some anger in my heart and lust that I wanted to get rid of and, and, um, and really just anger that was not allowing me to respond in a way that uh, was the gentleness or the husband that had gentleness and care and consideration. And I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to um, live life and not have done everything I can to be the father I want to be, the husband I want to be, the person that I want to be, and the follower of Jesus. And um, and in that process, it just was pulling back layers and going, God, make me more like Christ. Will you help me? There's still so much brokenness in my heart, and I need your help. Mm -hmm. And daily, I wish regeneration. It was like it's over, finished. It took yeah. me a year. I went through it. And now, for the rest of your life, you're just learning to put to death the deeds of the flesh, or put to death that sinful nature inside of you. So yeah. I think, again, the idea of you can't win, you will not be victorious, whatever your struggle is. I just wanna to put to that the lie that people have out there that you're gonna wake up one day and you won't even desire, you know, same-sex attraction won't happen. Maybe that's a part, maybe that'll happen. But for a lot of people, that's not. And they yeah. constantly put it to death. Or one day you're gonna wake up and you no longer have anxiety. I don't know the person that that's their story. And they're probably out there and God bless them. For most of us, it involves doing what Paul said, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the sinful nature, Galatians 5. Yeah. So anything you'd add? Yeah, I gotta I may, I got make sure I don't, there's like a passion point of mine. And I think especially because I know a lot of people my age, we have almost um, unintentionally been trained to be consumers. Mm. And what happens to consumers? They become fat and they don't know how to do things on their own. They're just sitting there like a baby bird with their mouth open wanting to be fed by their mom and they never become mature yeah. Christians. They don't ever get to feast on the meat. They stay on the milk all of their life. Yep. And that's not the life that Christ calls us to live. And so for me, I, I always tell people, hey, you have to get out of that consumeristic mindset. You have to stop waiting for things to come to you and you have to start being proactive, not reactive. That's yep. what I always say because the war is coming to you. That's why I personally love watching war movies because it reminds me so much of this mentality that there is a spiritual war going, <clears throat> waging war against my flesh every day. And I think a lot of people are like, oh, it's too gory, it's too bloody. And I'm like, that is nothing compared to the spiritual war 
that is going on and the enemy, that way that he is wanting to destroy you is nothing compared to even what you're seeing on that movie. Yeah. And when in those movies, a lot of times what's happening is, is like there's that scene where everything finally calms down and everyone's asleep, like in the bunkers or whatever. And then what do you know? You hear the sound and then just a bomb hits. Yeah. They had no time to prepare. They had no time to arm themselves and they are losing because they weren't ready and they couldn't have predicted it. The same with us. If you're not waking up every day Ephesians 6, putting on the armor of God, not praying, asking the Holy Spirit to lead you, to guide you, to convict you, and and walking proactively, it's going to be too late because the war is coming, whether you want it to or not. And I always say no one runs into the battle unarmed. And so when you make that choice, like you're talking about, when you make that choice to not get up every single day, put on that armor, grab the weapon, the sword, grab, grab people, other people, fellow people going to the fight with you and then ultimately um, following and trusting the commander, the Lord, I mean, you're going to fall. Totally. And so I just, I I would say for me, um, one myth that I just want to speak against really quick that I think is people look at people like us and they, they almost make it like we're really far off and that we don't get it. Like we don't have a, a, a flesh that wars every day. And I always tell people, I'm like, if only you knew how much I am getting tempted and how much the enemy is whispering in my ear and wanting me. He wants me just to fall one time to ruin everything that I, and and it, the, the goodness there is that God's grace abounds, but I'm saying, you know, there's no division between exactly. pastor and person out it there. It just keeps, totally. it's the rest of your life. And so you've got to be proactive. Here's what else is crazy. So we're, we'll hang in here just one more minute. Yeah. Um, again, you got nowhere to go is, uh, <laughs> I, I feel like we've gotten a, rub shoulders with just people, uh, incredible pastors, like well-known people uh, throughout the years who are leading incredible ministries in, uh, in, around the country. And what I, it was almost surprising to me, it sounds crazy to say that, and I, I'm hesitating to mention names here, but I, I bet a lot of our audience would know who those names are. Godly men, well-known people. Every single one of them has to do this as well. Yeah. Like you would think like, oh man, you're, you're ex person, you have to do that? You figured it out. Yeah, you figure, no, all of them, every single one of them. And anytime someone falls, like I'm never surprised. People always are always like shocked that, that somebody fell or made a mistake, had a moral failure. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, are you kidding me? They still have a sin nature. The thing that comes naturally to them every single day is moral failure, mm-hmm. thing that comes naturally to all of us. And so anytime we don't go to war daily and moment by moment or are thoughtful and intentional and careful, I have to crucify. I can't let this run me. The thing that runs in neutral is a sin nature. And every person, you never escape that. And, um, and those guys, if there's anything worth respecting about anybody of any significant platform in Christianity, it involves them daily crucifying yeah. their flesh. And, uh, just like anyone. Just like anyone, exactly. So, all right. So first thing that we see is that um, you can't win the battle. I'm sorry. First thing that we see is that you can't change the past, but you can alter the future. Second thing, if you can't win the battle, if you are unwilling to fight. And number three, take us home. You can't see the full story God is writing. This seems the most abstract and like, duh, I can't see. Are you t- oh, I can't see everything that God's doing. Wow. <laughs> Gotta trust him. Here's why I think this is profound. Because in the midst of the confusion, it can seem like God is absent. What is he doing? What is he up to? And for most of us, not most of us, all of us, you just can't see the full picture about what God is doing. You know, your dad passing away a few years ago, you have no idea all the ways that God has used that and is, you know, I'm confident you've seen some of the ways, but all of the different ways that God is, at the end of time, you're going to see like, wow, I had no idea this person's life and this person's life and this person's life. My dad got to meet his long lost daughter because of his cancer and got to lead her and her husband to Jesus. So if you could see that in this side of heaven, Think about all the ways that we'll be able to someday see the bigger picture of what God is writing. Mm -hmm. And if you and I pause and you just look around at the day circumstances or where you are in this moment, you'll be tempted to go, where the heck? God is clearly not at work. He's clearly not in this. Here's where this comes from the story. If Esther had stopped in the midst of the story and hit pause at so many different places, you'd been like, where, what is God doing where is he in the story? Like, what, what do I mean by that? Like, think about if she had stopped whenever her parents died. Because remember, she was an orphan. Mm-hmm. She buried both of her parents. Had to move in with her uncle Mordecai, that's Uncle Jesse, in the city of Susa, some, you know, place far away. Yeah. Had she stopped and gone like, my parents are dead. 
I'm a young girl. I'm an orphan. Where is God? If she had just stopped at that part of the story, she wouldn't have been able to see the bigger picture and the amazing ways God was still at work despite the brokenness of her circumstances. Had she stopped when she was forced to be a part of the bachelor Persia and basically every beautiful girl in the empire was ripped out of their home and put to be property of the king unless they won the competition and then they could be the queen. Mm -hmm. She would have been like, Where, how is God a part of this at all? Had she stopped when Mordecai, her uncle, stopped a murder or assassination attempt on the king's life. There was a hit. There was people trying to kill the king. Murdered or Mordecai discovered it and he uncovered it for the king and he saved his life. And the king did nothing to reward him for five years. Had you stopped, you'd be like, what? Especially because the guy who gets rewarded one verse later after Mordecai does that is Haman, the evil and wicked, you know, one who would try to kill all the Jewish people, all the people of God. Yeah. You're like, like, what the? Where is God? How could yeah. God clearly be at work? When Haman was promoted to prime minister, the most evil person who wants to kill everybody is now made the highest officer in the land. You'd go, where is God at work? When he convinces the king to kill all the Jewish people, when he uh, stops, when he makes a pole of death for Mordecai to die on and he goes to have him killed, you'd be like, what is God doing? And yet you couldn't see the full story that God was writing. And there was a reversal that came and none of us can see all the story and all the ways that God is writing and the bigger picture of our life and how he's using the fact that you lost that job and you ended up having to move that city or that relationship broke up or your parents ended up, um, you know, uh, somebody, a loved one ended up dying from cancer or someone somebody you know has coronavirus. Someone you know has coronavirus. Of work. You can't see if God is using all of this because he's still at work and we can't see the big picture, but we can trust him and he's working it for good. Mm -hmm. Here, let me show you a parallel. Here's what's crazy about the book of Esther. And I, I think the guys have this. All throughout the book, you can see like what is beautiful. It's an incredible piece of literature because there's, uh, there's like a big word for it. I won't give it because it'll just confuse people. <laughs> I call it just parallels mm -hmm. where it starts with a party full of pagans. You remember that the first week where it's like yep. they're all getting crazy drunk and the king told his first wife, hey, come in here, dance yeah, naked. Yeah. And she was like, no. no. And he was like, all right, you're no longer my wife then. So it starts with a party. Idiot. It ends with a party with the people of God. It starts with a party full of pagans. It ends with a party with the people of God. It starts with Esther identifying as a Gentile, hiding her Jewishness. And it ends with Jewish people or Gentiles identifying and becoming Jews. Hmm. Uh, it has, uh, the third chapter has the elevation of Haman, the evil person. It ends with the elevation of Mordecai. It involves a anti-Jewish, every Jewish person, you know, has got to give up their life, is going to lose their life. And it ends with the Jewish people protecting their lives and being victorious. It involves a banquet with Queen Esther. And then there's another banquet. And it all pivots around this royal procession of Mordecai, where he was kind of led throughout the street, streets. Remember when that Prince Ali, fabulous he moment, mm -hmm. um, where uh, Haman had to walk him around, basically celebrate. This is the guy the king really loves that saved him. But in the midst of all that, God took everything messed up and broken and the whole story communicates this. And he redeems it and he reverses it and he's at work in the midst of it. Mm -hmm. And the whole portrait of Esther is a reminder to you and to me that God is at work when I can't see it, when it doesn't make sense, when it doesn't even look like it. Like Corona, what is God doing in the midst of Corona? I, I don't know. I don't know all the ways, but here, here's some ways that I do know he's working. I do know that last week, because of coronavirus, somebody stumbled onto the porch live stream and they trusted in Christ. They trusted Jesus. And it happened the week before that as well, that people that wouldn't have been listening normally found somehow the stream and God saves their life. Mm -hmm. I know that all over the country, the church is rising up and in community after community, there's Christians who are going around and they're bringing, delivering food to people who have health problems or are elderly, and they're getting a chance to be the body of Christ in, in a unique way. Mm -hmm. I know that people are searching and looking for God. They're in the midst of this going, I've been stripped of so much security, yeah. and they're open to talking about their faith right now. Yeah. So I don't know all the ways, but I do know that he's at work, and those are just some of the ways that he's clearly at work all around us. And I don't know what you're walking through, and I don't know what you're facing, and I don't want to even pretend that some explanation I could give right now would completely satisfy that. But I do know the message of the book of Esther, of the Bible, is that God has promised to work all of those things and to take the most broken, horrific things and bring about good. Yeah. He did it most fully on the cross with Jesus, dying on the cross. The worst day in human history was the greatest day in human history where Jesus... God himself, who became a man, 
was crucified and died for you and me. Mm -hmm. And that day, that was the worst day in history, is also the greatest day because it allowed you and I to receive forgiveness of sins by simply putting our faith in him. Romans chapter eight, verse uh, 28 through 31 says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. For God, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Mm -hmm. Paul says, no matter what we walk through as a Christian, we know that God has promised he's gonna weave everything to good, everything together for good. Let me say two last things. We, uh, I bought a puzzle recently. It's a 500 piece puzzle. I was like, we're gonna do this as a family. It's gonna be so fun. It's gonna be awesome. <laughs> and uh, have you ever done like a big puzzle? Yeah. So I didn't realize how many pieces 500 pieces yeah, it's was. Yeah, a long time. Oh, dude, I was like, I thought a four-year-old was gonna do it with me. Like, this is gonna be so fun. We're gonna be <laughs> right. bonding. And he had no idea. It was like this safari puzzle and just the tiny little pieces and where they all fit. And so it ended up being like this thing that I will do as a family that I just did because I couldn't let my pride get in the way of like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm going to finish this thing. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it became like the thing that I did for like six Saturdays in a row uh, <laughs> during nap time uh, just because couldn't let the gift the best of me. And, um, and just as I think about that, I was constantly going like, where does this piece fit into the bigger picture? Like, how does this all fit together? And if you were to give me like a 5,000-piece puzzle or a 50-million-piece puzzle, I would have gone, there's no way I could ever with the lifetime figure it all out. God is the one over all of our lives and all the brokenness in our world who has promised that he's taking all these puzzle pieces that we have no idea, no ability to figure out how do they all fit together. And he's promised I'm working them and fitting them into a bigger picture you can't see right now. But one day you will, and one day all the pieces will begin to make sense. And in the meantime, you can trust me. And the story of Esther was that, hey, you can trust me. I'm working and I'm going to bring good about. And I don't know who's walking through a situation right now where you just need to be reminded of that. And you need just... A, um, a moment where you just declare to God, will you help me to believe that? Mm -hmm. I don't know where this puzzle piece that I'm holding right now fits and I need your help. And the God who's there wants you to, to come to him and call on him. Finally, um, just as we finish this book, what I think is remarkable about this story is, is there's parallels to Jesus in the story. Yeah. In Luke chapter 24, um, do you know what I'm talking about, Luke chapter 24? The road to... Damascus. Oh, no, not Damascus. No, you're close, you're close. The road to Emmaus. Emmaus. Jesus is on the road to Emmaus, and he has it's a conversation. Like <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> it's a weird road. Amazing. And on the road, he's talking with two of these disciples, and, and just for the point of, of being brief, he basically says, hey, everything in the prophets and the Old Testament and the scriptures was about me. You knew that, right? It was all pointing to the fact that a Messiah would come he would be crucified, he would give his life, and he would save his people. All of it, hmm. including the book of Esther. How does Esther point to Jesus? Well, in so many ways, we see Jesus is a better Esther. Esther risked her physical life to save her people from physical death. Jesus gave his life to save not her people, but all people from eternal death. Esther left her poverty for the palace. Jesus left the palace of heaven for the poverty of earth. Esther appealed to the king to rescue her people from destruction. Jesus appealed to God, the father, to rescue us from sin's destruction. Mm. Esther entered the palace uninvited by the king. Jesus entered into our world unwelcomed by his people. Esther fought against an evil enemy, Haman. Christ defeated once and for all the ultimate evil enemy, Satan. Mm. Esther boldly identified herself with God's people to spare their lives. Jesus identified himself with humanity to spare our lives. Esther saved God's people, spread across one nation in one generation. Jesus saved God's people from every nation and every generation. The whole book and ultimately the whole story of the Bible points to Jesus. And I just wanna share one last time for anyone listening, because just like last week and the week before, there's been people who tune in who have never put their faith in Jesus. You've never had a moment in your life where you said, I believe 
Not that I'm a good enough person to go to heaven or not that because I'm so bad, God wouldn't want anything to do with me. But I believe that Jesus on the cross died for my sin. He paid for all of it. And if I'm gonna have a relationship with God, it's gonna be because I receive his free gift in giving his life for me to have eternal life. And he was buried and he rose from the dead and it changed the world. It reset the calendar. It redefined existence. And it is ultimately not what the story of Esther about alone, but what your life and all of life is about. Mm -hmm. And God hasn't forgotten you. He loves you. He cares about you. He's at work in the midst of all of this. And maybe you're sitting right now listening and you're locked in at home and under quarantine. And one of the reasons God wants you to be there is because he wants you to know he loves you. He gave his life to prove it. And if you will trust in that message and in Jesus, you'll receive eternal life. And not just experience the God who saved the queen, but God who saves you and I and all people who call on him. So good. So mm. let me pray. And then we're gonna do one last worship song. Father, thank you that you have been at work since the beginning of time. You're working right now all around us. That You are the same God who saved the people of the Jewish nation 500 years before Jesus was around through Esther and Mordecai. And you're the same God who saved so many of us listening right now by putting our faith in you. And so I do pray for anyone who's never had that moment. Tonight would be their night. I pray for friends that are struggling financially and anxious. They're anxious because of challenges that they're facing. And you'd meet them where they're at. They'd have other believers in their life to generously provide for needs. I pray for anyone who's affected directly in terms of their health with the coronavirus, that you would meet them right there where they're at. They'd have amazing recovery in front of them and the body of Christ caring for them and around them. Thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. That the same God um, who was at work, even when we couldn't see and understand it, is still at work, even when we can't see and understand it. And that he loves us and gave his life for us. We love you and we worship you now in song. In Christ's name, amen. Amen.